Shabbat Shalom. All right. I'm going to depart from this week's Torah portion. I really am excited about what I'm going to be teaching on today. Because I, like so many of you, so many of you are tired of all the religious shenanigans, are you not? I mean, you finally wake up, you finally wake up to all the tripe, all the religious paganism, and all the lawlessness so common in the church, and you start to become comfortable with the Torah. You start to become comfortable with everything Israel. And then what happens? Whomp! You get another conviction, another conviction and check within your own ruach. And this leads to prayer, it leads to study, it leads to investigation. And I cry out again, I seriously do, oh no, not more, really? I've been duped again by another religion with a different set of nonsense. And I have been cautioned, I've got to tell you, I have been cautioned. I love the looks right now. I have been cautioned, I've been even warned. You need to be quiet, you need to protect your ministry, it's not worth talking about it, you're going to cause trouble. But what kind of ministry is it if I'm going to be silent and not speak about the conviction that I have when I'm in the Word? That's no ministry. I don't want to be silent. So, my friends, this Shabbat, I throw caution to the wind and this stupid thing to the wind and I decide to stray from the Torah portion and address my convictions and my investigations into the Word and a lot of history today to shed some insight into what's really afoot with Purim. I mean, I wore a religious head covering for most of my 30s. And here I was standing up before you with that silly thing on my head. I mean, I've come a long way. So, let's dig in today to what's really afoot with Purim. And I want to thank so many writers over the years who have emailed me and sent me questions and sent me information over the years because I have had so many people in the Hebrew Roots or Messianic movement that have been concerned about Purim. And it hasn't been addressed. And now I can't quote all the sources as, there, as there's been many emails over the years, but I've tried where cited so that you can further your own investigations. Because what I'm going to do today is I'm going to share with you a lot of information. We may even have to take a break. But you need to go and search these things out and draw your own conclusions. Let's start with the history of the book of Esther. That's a good place to start, isn't it? Well, the question of even whether the book of Esther belongs in the canon of Scripture, has been raised since the early period by both Jews and Christians alike. The book of Esther is one of a small literary group of books, along with Tobit and Judith, with very distinctive characteristics. And the text is extremely difficult to determine. The book has two forms. One, the long Hebrew, and two, the short, which is in the Greek. Now, of the Greek text, there are two principal types. That of the current Greek Bible, that, that has a widely viri, um, variant recension of Lucian of Antioch. It has six additional chapters within, within it, and an extra 107 verses appear interspersed within it. That's the Septuagint, the Greek translation text of the Old Testament, but it does not to appear in the Protestant canon. 
Now, the Greek version contains the following passages not found in the Hebrew. There's a dream of Mordecai that's not found in the Hebrew. Chapter 1, verse 1. There's an explanation given about that dream in chapter 10, verse 3. There's two edicts to Ahasuerus, chapter 3, verse 13, and chapter 8, verse 12. And then there's this prayer to Mordecai in chapter 4, verse 17. There's a prayer to Esther as well. And then there's a second account of Esther's appeal to Ahasuerus in chapter 5, verse 1 and verse 2. And then there's an appendix explaining the origin of the Greek version, in which actually Jerome placed his translation of these passages after the translated Hebrew text. So the book of Esther belongs to a type of literature which treats history and geography with a whole amount of freedom. Now, the book's absence from the earliest lists of canonical books, its lack of citation in the New Testament, its lack of references of Elohim, and its lack of religious practices, its excessive Jewish nationalism, and its spirit of vengeance have troubled troubled believers for millennia. There's always been a question about this book. Add to that that it is conspicuous within the Dead Sea Scrolls is conspicuously absent, excuse me. It's not within the Dead Sea Scrolls. It brings further doubt to its origin. It never mentions the name Yahweh, not even once, nor Elohim. It doesn't mention worship. It doesn't mention prayer. It doesn't mention sacrifice. In the text, there's no thanksgiving of Yahweh for deliverance. None of the characters in the book are mentioned in any other books in Scripture or in any historical records, of course, outside of the Talmud and the rabbinical Kabbalah. In sum, there is no early Christian churches that accepted this book's canosity. None. Now, in the Hebrew version... Haman is called an Agite, or a Malachite. But in the Greek, he's called a Macedonian. But they're two totally different races. They both can't be right. So the author of Esther doesn't criticize the means employed for victory, nor does the author engage in any moral reflection about the massive genocide and the motive of the Avengers, the Jews. There is why there are some reasons why people over the millennia have doubted the book's origin. Down through history, people have considered the book of Esther interesting Jewish literature, a story, but didn't give it scriptural validity or place any value on it. They didn't believe it had any historical basis and considered the book in the ranks of the book of Tobit and Judith. It was an interesting literary tale, but not much more. Now, it would be a tragic mistake, a tragic mistake, for any believer to consider the events depicted in the book of Esther as models for behavior as models for unveiling prophecy and timelines. And this is the rub. Many believers celebrate Purim as if it were because their teachers teach it as if it's going to become prophecy involving, you guessed it, the rebuilt temple, the altar, the Levitical priesthood, and all of that stuff. Let's look at the name Esther. It's a form of Ishtar, the Babylonian sex goddess, of course, known today as Easter. Some say that Esther derives from the Persian word stara, meaning star or hidden star. Of course, 
the star of David or the star of Rapham, Esther and Mystery Babylon from the book of Revelation are one and the same. In chapter 2, verse 9 of the book of Esther, Esther's reception of special portions of food is in actually direct contrast to the prophet Daniel, is it not? Because unlike Daniel, Esther didn't follow the dietary commandments. She was fully assimilated. Chapter 2, verse 9. Chapter 7, verse 4. Esther conceives the tactic of arguing that Haman's financial offer in chapter 3, verse 9, wouldn't ever compensate for the king's damages of lost revenues should the Jews be expelled. If the Jews were to be expelled, the king would never be compensated for his lost revenues of taxes. Never! And this is the tactic which was used and later employed in 1180 in France and in 1290 in England to try and thwart the Jewish expulsion. The royals would never recover from lost revenues if the Jews were expelled from France or England. You see, this tactic in chapter 7 verse 4 comes all the way forward to us today and to the Federal Reserve Bank. Because the Federal Reserve Bank is a consortium of nine Zionist Jewish owned and associated banks with the Rothschilds at the head. Number one, the Rothschilds Bank of London and Berlin. Number two, Lazard Brothers Banks of Paris. Number three, Israel Moses Seth Banks of Italy. Number four, Warburg Bank of Hamburg and Amsterdam. Number five, Lehman Brothers of New York. Number six, Kuhn, Loeb Bank of New York, which is now Shearson American Express. Number seven, Goldman Sachs of New York. Number eight, the National Bank of Commerce, New York, which is Morgan Guarantee Trust. And number eight, nine, Hanover Trust of New York, which is William and David Rockefeller and Chase National Bank New York are the principal shareholders. You see, these are the owners of the global regime that you and I have been enslaved into. Want to celebrate Purim? We need to look at this and see where this is coming from and why Yahweh allowed the book of Esther to be in the canon. So we could celebrate genocide, so we could celebrate the slaughter of the goyim, or because he would like us to know what's going on in the end of days with the great deception of the seed of the serpent. Let's look at the name Mordecai. Mordecai comes from Marduk, Marduk, which was the Babylonian city god. So we've got the fertility goddess, Ishtar, and Marduk, the Babylonian city god. It also means a little man or a worshipper of Mars. Now the prophet Daniel stated that there were actually 120 provinces within Persia. But Esther chapter 1 verse 1 says that there was 127. There's no historical record of Vashti. She doesn't exist. But there are five hidden acrostics within the book of Esther. Where the, where the yod he vav he appears within a phrase. But his name, Yahweh, isn't mentioned within the book of Esther, but there are these five hidden acrostics. Num chapter 1, verse 20, within the, the, the phrase, all the wives shall give, y you find Yahweh written backwards. Within the phrase, 
all the wives shall give, you find the yod, hey, vav, hey, and it's written backwards. Because this really is a backwards book, and it's really a backwards story. I mean, you'll be backwards and forwards, to in and fro in, and you won't know where you're going, and then you'll get sucked in by the religious leaders to come and celebrate Purim. And you're a believer in Yeshua. Well, believers in Yeshua need to do things distinctly different than the broad road of the religious masses. And that's why I want to bring forth this information so that you can do your research and you can decide in a couple of weeks whether you're going to go party with the Khazars. Now in Judaism discovered by Michael Hoffman, this is what he states, quote, the spring festival of Purim is a pagan holiday in Jerusalem characterized by Bachillian scenes of drunken coveting, Halloween-style clothing and masks, Talmudic men and rabbis cross-dressed as women, and a general topsy-turvy, backwards, Lord of Misrule type of ambiance. Pretty much sums it up. But let's not stop there. Let's go to the Jewish Encyclopedia. And the Jewish Encyclopedia acknowledges that there are too many improbabilities for the book of Esther to be true. And it points out five major things. Let's touch on that. Five improbabilities of the story. Number one. It's generally recognized that Ahasuerus mentioned in the book of Esther in Ezra chapter 4 verse 6 and in Daniel chapter 9 verse 1 is identical with the Persian king known as Exeris who reigned from 485 to 464 before the common era. But it's impossible, listen, it's impossible to find any historical parallel for a Jewish consort to this king. There's no Esther. Not in history. Some critics formally identified Esther with Amartesis, who is mentioned by Herodotus as the queen of Exeres at the time when Esther, according to Esther 2.6, became the wife of Ahasuerus. But, um, but Amastris, however, was the daughter of a Persian general and therefore not a Jewess. Well, that's a problem. It continues, the fact of Amastris' reign doesn't agree with the biblical narrative of Esther. Besides all this, it's impossible to connect the two names etymologically. McClimmott in the Hastings Dictionary Bible thinks it's possible that Esther and Vashti may have been merely the chief favorites of the harem and are consequently not mentioned in par parallel historical accounts. It's very doubtful whether the haughty Persian aristocracy, always highly influential with the monarch, would have tolerated the choice of a Jewish queen and a Jewish prime minister to the exclusion of their own class. Not to speak of the improbability of the prime ministry of Haman the Agite who preceded Mordecai. Agagite can only be interpreted here as synonymous with Amalekite. Operat's attempt to connect the term Agagite with Agaz, a Midian tribe mentioned by Sargon, cannot be taken seriously. The term, as applied to Haman, is a gross anachronism, and the author of Esther no doubt used it intentionally as a fitting name for the enemy of Israel. In the Greek version of Esther, Haman is called Macedonian. The second reason why the Jewish encyclopedia doubts the story is this. Number two, 
Perhaps the most striking point against the historical value of the book of Esther is the remarkable, de remarkable decree permitting the Jews to massacre their enemies and fellow subjects during a period of two days. If such an extraordinary event had actually taken place, should not some confirmation of the Biblo account, biblical account have been found in other records? You would think so. Again, could the king have withstood the attitude of the native nobles who would have hardly have looked upon such an occurrence without offering armed resistance to their feeble and capricious sovereign? A similar objection may be made against the probability of the first edict permitting Haman the Amalekite to massacre all the Jews. Would there not be some confirmation of it in parallel historical records? There's nothing. It doesn't exist. The whole section bears the stamp of free invention. This is from the Jewish Encyclopedia. Number three. Extraordinary also is the statement that Esther didn't reveal her Jewish origin when she was chosen queen. Although it was known that she came from the house of Mordecai, a Jew. Who was a professing Jew. And that she maintained a constant communication with him from the harem which was against the custom of the land. That didn't happen. Once you were in the harem, you were in the harem. You didn't have a man coming into the harem, having constant communication. These are things that trouble me. But you shouldn't teach this. It's not worth it, Matthew. You've got a ministry to... Pre I mean, we need to ask these questions. This isn't religion. This is about us being disciples of Yeshua and asking the hard questions. You don't need me to tell you the answer, but you do need to do your due diligence, as I do, to dig into the word of Yahweh and question the status quo and the religious rhetoric. Instead, let's put up a banner and invite you all in two weeks to come and celebrate Purim. Let's put masks on, silly things on our head, and um, bake cookies. And let's try and make it got, have something to do with biblical prophecy. It's, it's absolutely a fake, phony farce. So we'll continue on. The Jewish Encyclopedia, the fourth reason they doubt the book of Esther. Hardly less striking is the description of the Jews by Haman as being dispersed among the people in all their provinces of thy kingdom and as a disobedient to the king's laws. This certainly applies more to the Greek than to the Persian period, in which the diaspora had, been, had not yet begun, and during which there is no record of a rebellious tendencies on the part of the Jews against the royal authority. And number five from the Jewish Encyclopedia, it says, finally, in this connection, the author's knowledge of the Persian customs is not in keeping with contemporary records. The chief conflicting points are as follows. A. Mordecai was per permitted free access to his cousin in the harem, a state of affairs wholly at variance with Oriental usage, both ancient and modern. B. The queen could not send a message to her ho own husband. C. The division of the empire into 127 provinces contrasts strangely with the 20 historical Persian satraps. And it contrasts with the prophet Daniel. D. The fact that Haman tolerated for a long time Mordecai's refusal to do obeisance is hardly in accordance with the customs of the East. Any native venturing to stand in the presence of a Turkish Grand Vizier could certainly be dealt with severely and without delay. E. 
This very refusal of Mordecai to prostrate himself belongs rather to the Greek than to the earlier Oriental period, when such an act would have involved no personal degradation. Most of the proper names, now this is F, most of the proper names in Esther which are given as Persian appear to be rather of Semitic than of Iranian origin, in spite of Ophopet's attempt to explain many of them from the Persian. So as we can see, even the Jewish encyclopedia has got some problems and some issues that it brings forth. But let's talk about the 20th century. Let's talk about these Purim fests that happened in the 20th century. There was this show trial of the German Nazis that started in Nuremberg in 1946. Because Purim to the Jewish Zionist mind is a time when you slaughter the Goyim, when you slaughter everyone who is non-Jewish. So, let's look at these 20th century Purim trials. The first there beginning with the Nazi trial at Nuremberg in 1946. It was a Purim extravaganza. A Purim extravaganza. American judges were flown over to Nuremberg to break the Constitution because they were outside of America. What they did was break constitutional law which they were bound by and then went and proceeded to be judges over an international tribunal forsaking their oaths of where they were sworn to be judges. Because in America there are constitutional laws and amendments that have to be adhered to that were not adhered to in those trials. It began with the defendants being unmercifully tortured and beaten in their cells all were forced to make false confessions and exactly 10 prisoners were hung on the gallows. Just like in the book of Esther with what we find the 10 sons of Haman being hung. Now Julius Streicher was one of the 10 hung at Nuremberg. Interestingly, it was not officially on Purim Fest when the 10 Germans were hung. But Strechler's last words before being hung on the gallows stunned the onlookers. He declared, This is my celebration of Purim 1946. I am now going to God. The Bolsheviks will hang you all one day. Then in March 1986, the Jewish Observer, a Jewish publication, bragged that the ten Nazis killed at Nuremberg for their crimes against the Jews had been found guilty of modern humanism. Now Colonel Don de Grand Pre writes in Barbarians Inside the Gates, quote, one must read the book of Esther in the Bible to fully understand the implications of the Nuremberg trials. Let's talk about Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein and his sons were viewed as modern day Haman and his sons. And after the Highway of Death massacre, President Bush ordered a cessation of hostilities, did he not? The war ended on February the 28th, 1991. February the 28th, 1991 was none other than Ju the Jewish festival of Purim. If you look at a lot of the dates that the politician, the presidents, and the leaders do things, which are actually celebrated by APEC and the Jewish lobby, they happen on Purim. Because the world doesn't know it, but those that celebrate Purim see the connection. So what happened? On Purim, President Bush, in fact, ordered a cessation of hostilities on that day. This fact means that the slaughter of these fleeing Iraqi soldiers it occurred when? 
Purim 1991. Then there was a 48-hour ultimatum to Saddam and his sons precisely paralleled to the Jewish holiday, Purim. Because at 8.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on March 17, 2003, the president appeared on TV to announce a 48-hour ultimatum to Saddam Hussein to leave the country with his sons. Haman and his sons must leave. Otherwise, what would happen? They would suffer an invasion. Thus, the 48-hour ultimatum expired when? 8.15 Eastern Standard Time, March 19th. And in Israeli time, President Bush appeared on TV at 3.15 a.m. on March 18th, and the deadline expired at 3.15 March 20th. Purim was celebrated that year from sundown, March 17th, through March 19th. In fact, the Purim celebration that year was comprised of the following events. March 17th was Ta'anit Esther, the feast of Queen Esther, of course, the heroine of Purim. March 18th was, in fact, Purim. And March 19th was Shushan Purim, the day Purim is celebrated in Jerusalem and other cities. So for the whole entire 48-hour period, an ultimatum that was given to Saddam Hussein, it occurred precisely during the time of Purim and the celebration of Purim in Jerusalem. You can see that President Bush deliberately chose March 20th, 2003 as the start of his war against Iraq. Why? Because it was important and a very specific occult day to the current Jewish considerations of the presidency. And there's even a question I have about Haman's sons. If Haman's sons had already been killed, all ten of them, in chapter 9, verse 12, how could they be hung the next day, which was tomorrow, in chapter 9, verse 13? Could you tell me that? Just something that troubles me. I want to expose the hate, the racism, and the intolerance that Purim is. The violence of the book of Esther is a kind of civil war, of which Cicero called the worst of all calamities. Theodosius II, who was a Byzantine emperor from 408 to 450, he put an end, put an end to these indecent scenes by the enactment of a law prohibiting the festival. He knew that it was wrong and he wanted to put a law to enact the end of this festival. And he said, there is no single fact in history more clearly obvious than the peculiar animosity of the Jews for all peoples other than their own. It is only to be understood on the basis of the almost incredible obsession of race superiority. The myth of the chosen people, the general antagonism against all Gentiles in general is surpassed only by the Jewish hatred of believers in Jesus, Christianity in particular. You see, from its inception, Zionism has a symbolic relationship, excuse me, a symbiotic relationship with anti-Semitism. From its inception, Zionism has a symbiotic relationship with anti-Semitism. Leo Pinsker, perhaps the first to articulate political Zionism, argued in his 1882 book, auto-emancipation that the Judophobia is intractable. As a psychic aberration, it is hereditary, it is a disease transmitted for 2,000 years and it's incurable. You see, the Kabbalistic secret of Purim is that the Hitlers and the Saddams of the world make the advancement 
of the Judaic equilibrium possible because without violent, implacable opposition to and the hatred of all Jewish persons, including law-abiding ones of goodwill, the rabbinic work of the occult cannot advance. They have to have it. Let's look at the Purim customs from Bar Ilan Jewish University. This is from the Jewish University in Israel, Purim customs. In synagogues, Jewish children beat willow branches to symbolize the beating of Haman. They beat, whip, and hang life-sized dolls of Haman. What's really disturbing is messianics today get caught up in the most sickening act of Purim, the symbolic eating of Haman's ears. After which, he, when he was, he was hung, then he was decapitated, and they ate his ears, and now messianics get caught up with eating of hamantaschen. It's sickening. And they'll, be, they'll put all these lovely recipes out in, in, in the Hebrew Roots cookbooks. And you're like, drink the Kool-Aid, man. <laughs> really? Wild. Wild. There's cross-dressing. Rabbi Shlomo Ephraim Lonchitz, one of the great rabbis of Prague at the time of Rama, spoke out against the custom of cross-dressing in his book Olilot Ephraim, in Article 309, seeing that on Purim, he said, quote, they change their nature by putting masks on their faces till they become someone else and no one knows them since they have all had costumes and they become women since a man wears women's clothing and all the women put a mask on their faces so that those who see them do not recognize or know them to be understand who's who. Should this be the nature of the day of festivity and favor before Elohim? And what source have they for these improper customs? Special delicacies? For the festive meal of Purim, as well as for other meals of the holiday, special dishes which somehow hint to the miracle of Purim are customary. Number one, Hamantaschen. This is all from the Bar Ilan Jewish University. Okay, this is from their own records. I didn't make this up. Hamantaschen, or Osne Haman, Haman's ears. In the Ashkenazi communities, these triangular baked pockets filled with poppy seed or other sweet fillings are ever present. The custom originates in Ashkenaz, Germany. They have become the most well-known and widespread Purim delicacy in all communities over the world. Today, liberal Jews try to cover up this fact and tell gullible Gentiles that these triangular fruit-filled cookies are really only supposed to represent Haman's triangular hat. But that just isn't so. Number two. The other delicacy of Purim is called kreplak, chop meat covered with dough, also triangular in shape. The name has received a popular etymology. Kreplak are eaten only on the days on which there is both a hitting and a beating and eating. Purim, the symbolic beating, thrashing of Haman's flesh. That's what you're eating symbolically, his ears and his torn open flesh. Want a party? And finally, the third dish, the fish dishes are eaten on Purim because Pisces, fish, is the sign of the month of Adar. Purim is meant to stir up hate and mistrust into the Jewish heart against the Gentile world with both booing and hissing and hate-filled synagogue services. You see, there's two types of Jews. There are evil leaders of a religious and political entity 
that are not Jews. They say they are Jews, and the world recognizes them as Jews. They, the world even recognizes them as Israel. But listen to what Yahweh's word reveals in Revelation 2, verse 9. I know the blaspheming of them which say they are Jews and are not, but they are the synagogue of S.A. 10. You see, not all Israel is Israel, as Rav Shaliak Shaul said. When the Jews returned from Babylon, they went to Jerusalem, but they took back Babylonian names and practices. Babylon was the center of satanic magic and pagan worship, astrology, and secret Masonic rituals. It's been suggested that there are two types of Jews since that time. One is called the Jew, the Zionist, who celebrates the Feast of Purim, the other is called the Yahudahite or the Yahwist that celebrates the feasts of Yahweh. And that is what we need to distinguish between. There are two types of Jew. There is the Zionists that celebrates Purim, wants to slay the Gentiles, and then there is the Yahudahite, the Yahwist, that wants to celebrate the feasts of Yahweh. Not all Israel is Israel. Why did Yahweh let Esther be included in the canon? Well, I think it's for those seeking to learn the origin of all evil happenings in the last days. I mean, just look at the Feast of Esther. Just look at Purim. I mean, the Jews, the Zionists, have this sense of immediate extermination that's always coming. The sense of immediate extermination. And this sense of imminent extermination that comes with Purim is ingrained into the Jewish psyche and is used to manipulate them and justify any behavior. Intelligence gathering tells me to expect that Zionist Israel will strike Iran on one of these years on the Illuminati's Kabbalah holiday of Purim. A day of vengeance on Persia, is it not? The book of Esther was exchanged between the United States of America and the state of Israel with an official handoff in talks about Iran with Obama and Netanyahu. Did you know that? It's symbolic. These dates that things are set. And the heathen, of course, are so busy watching the Super Bowl, they have no idea. Well, it's Valentine's Day. They have no idea what day it is. Oh, but you don't think the politicians know who are getting their hands filled with money from the Zionist lobby? And you don't think that the Zionists know when Purim is and what it's all about? Oh my goodness. You go back into history and look at the dates. You go back. I'm just saying, I'm just opening it up to you. But you go do the research and you think if it's all coincidence. And if it is coincidence, why did Obama and Netanyahu exchange the book of Esther in discussions about Iran? Oh, it was just, you know, a nice present out of all the things that you could give someone when you're discussing Iran. Wow. In June 2004, Madonna, during her involvement in the mystic religion of Kabbalah, of course, which is Lucifer's twisted version of the Hebrew faith, she publicly announced that she wants to be called Esther. <laughs> you see, Purim is a celebration. It is a celebration. It is a celebration about compromising your faith. It's a celebration about having to deal with the consequences of living a compromised faith. 
If you're compromising your faith and you're having to deal with the consequences of living a compromised life, go knock yourself out with Purim. Because that's what it's really about. Listen, we all know people who've cut off their primary spiritual avenues to Yahweh because of unbelief and rebellion. We all know people like that. People who refuse to return. People who refuse to repent. Well, consequently, inferior paths of rescue remain the only ones open to them. And this is the whole context of Purim. A very nationalistic, unspiritual tale, kind of like Hanukkah. It teaches us that it's okay to spiritually marry yourself to a pagan deity, to a demon in order to rescue you, yourself from a situation caused by your own apostasy. Esther and Mordecai should have been in Judea. They shouldn't have even been in Babylon. But they refused to return. So therefore, an inferior path was only left open to them. They lived a compromised life. They should have returned to Jerusalem with Ezra and Nehemiah. But they didn't. It's a lesson for us in the exile in the USA today. You see, they remained in Persia clinging to their religion but refusing to re return home. So they did the next best thing and had to face tough consequences, tough choices based upon that poor decision. What are we going to do? What are we going to do if we're given the opportunity to go and harvest the land of biblical Israel? Will we stay here back in the opulence and comfort of exile? Because if we do, we'll have to deal with the same consequences. You see, if we follow the Esther model, we won't make it. We won't make it. The Esther model is for those who have been disobedient and are trying to get rescued from a life-threatening situation, having chosen to be in the wrong place. Many of our Christian brethren, in fact, the vast majority, are going to find themselves in the Esther situation. When the secret rapture fails to materialize and the Antichrist system starts rounding them up and deporting them to FEMA camps for mass extermination. I mean, will you head with Yahweh to the 12 cities of refuge? Or will you refuse to stay in the opulence of exile and have your own Purim party? You see, Purim is about a celebration of compromising your faith and having to deal with the consequences of it. They should have been in Judea, and you don't spiritually marry yourself to a pagan, literally, or a spiritual demon. Because if you do, inferior paths are the only ones left open to you. You see, the word poor, which is in Esther chapter 3, verse 7, chapter 9, verse 24 and 26, it's said to mean lot, like you're casting a lot, but it's not even a Hebrew word. It's from the Assyrian pura, which means a pebble or a small stone, which could be used like dice. Let's talk about Nicanor's day. Nicanor's day. You see, the 13th, month, the 13th of the month of Adar, the date of which is the fast of Esther, falls as history, as a history of both jubilant and a mournful day. You see, the 13th of the month of Adar is when the fast of Esther falls. That is a mournful day, is it not? Yet... Nicanor's day also falls on the 13th of Adar. But Nicanor's day is a joyous, jubilant day. So which is it? What is the 13th of Adar? Is it a jubilant day for the Jews? Or is it a day of mourning? Because it can't be both, but it's both. 
So let's look into it. You see, during the early Maccabean era, the 13th, I mean, I love, I mean, the word of Yahweh is like, it's, you are mining for treasure. There is nothing more marvelous than staying up when you should be in bed and you've got a thread and you're like, this is, this is not, someone's been lying to me again. I'm going in the Word and I am going to find out because Yahweh will reveal His secrets to His saints. Will He not? To those that are righteously and earnestly seeking Him and that don't have an agenda. The only agenda that we have is the truth of Yahweh through the blood of Yeshua HaMashiach. We've got nothing to fear but fear itself. Is that from a movie? You see, that's that programming, right? That you're always, I, some, I got programmed. I mean, I, that was somewhere back there. Nicanor's day. During the early Maccabean era, the 13th of Adar was not the fast of Esther. But it was the feast of Nicanor. But hang on a minute. I thought... Esther was before the Maccabean era. So surely they would have been kept in keeping the fast of Esther. Then why weren't they? Why were they having a feast of Nicanor? Doesn't make sense. You see, at the time, Nicanor's feast was the happiest holiday of the Jewish calendar. So who was this Giza Nicanor? And why did he merit such an illustrious feast? And where the heck did it go? Why is it not on the calendar today? Maybe it wasn't politically expedient for the rabbis, the Herodians. First Maccabees reports that not long after the events of comm commemorate, excuse me, commemorating Hanukkah, King Demetrius's nephew. King Demetrius, the nephew of Antiochus Epiphanes, dispatched his Jew-hating general Nicanor. Then Nicanor was sent on a mission to slaughter Judah Maccabee and the people once and for all. The fateful battle between Judah and Nicanor took place on none other than the 13th of Adar. But things didn't quite turn out the way Nicanor had planned. He ended up getting his head lopped off, decapitated, and his head stuck on a spike outside of Jerusalem. So, Nicanor's day, the 13th of Adar, became a feast, a celebration, a party for the Jews. Nicanor's day was described in the second book of Maccabees as a feast to celebrate this deliverance and was widely observed in the land of Israel over the next two centuries until the destruction of the temple. Yet despite its one-time prominence, this feast of Nicanor, it's vanished from the Jewish calendar. What happened to Nicanor's day? And how could such a happy occasion be celebrated on the 13th of Adar in the first place? Can you tell me that? Because the 13th of Adar, according to the book of Esther, was celebrated and set aside, not celebrated, excuse me, but set aside not for a celebration, but for a day of fasting. So how could Nicanor's day have come along anyway in the first place? Very suspicious. Very suspicious. Well, apparently, in Maccabean times, neither Purim nor the fast that precedes it are mentioned anywhere outside the book of Esther. Not mentioned at all. 
Now, Jewish tradition dates the book of Esther to the 5th century before the Common Era, but it was probably written around the first time of the first Hanukkah. In fact, it would be three centuries before the word Purim is first coined. And where was it coined? None other than the Mishnah. Hmm. But it gets worse for all of those that are trying to argue of Purim's history. The single hint of an emergent proto-Purim is found in the decree in the book of 2 Maccabees announcing that the feast of Nicanor on Adar 13. The text notes that the feast falls one day before a certain Mordecai's day, if you actually read the text. A previously unmentioned but obvious precursor to Purim. I think because the early, rab early rabbis wanted to de-emphasize anything Hasmonean, especially anything that glorified the Maccabees' military victories, in part because these rabbis played no role whatsoever in the victories or the liberation of the temple they brought about. In fact, in part because the Hasmonean dynasty at that time had ups usurped the kingship, and it had usurped the Zadokite priesthood. They decided to replace Nicanor's day with the fast and Marduk's day. Mars, the city god's day, burst into Purim. Because what was happening is they were under political pressure that the celebration of Nicanor's day meant that you were celebrating the victory. You were celebrating the victory over those that were still intent on killing you and being your guardians. Yet, Purim was from a nation far off and no threat to their political hierarchy at the time. It benefited them, behooved them to switch it over. And it began when? On Marduk's day. Just read 2 Maccabees. Read Maccabees and see this Nicanor's day is a key. You see, Purim, it fits no divine pattern of the redemption of man. No divine pattern of the redemption of man from sin by Messiah, but rather it tends to encourage revenge killing that has no part in the new covenant. We're not called to go and kill and revenge on our enemies. It fits no pattern to believers in Yeshua who are redeemed by his blood. Yahweh has declared that we are not to take revenge upon our enemies. I mean, Martin Luther doubted the book's canosity. He doubted Esther's canosity. The great synagogue, consisting of 120 rabbinical scholars, canonized the Hebrew book of Esther as scripture, but only after a redaction had been made of an original work written allegedly by Mordecai himself. But why did this council create a redaction? Why did they not leave the original writing of Mordecai unedited? The spiritual fruits of Purim and Hanukkah observance led first to the sacking of the Zadokites, then Hellenistic Greek control, and then Herodian and Roman control. You see, today's modern Zionists are following the exact same tradition. They are halting any hope of a Zadokite priesthood by terrorism birthed by Ergun and other PLO and Hamas-like terrorist groups against, first of all, in the beginning of the 20th century, they warred with terrorism against the British, then the Arabs. I talk so many times about the fact that the Ashkenazi are the sons of Japheth. 
Ashkenaz, sons of Japheth. Not Shemetic, but Jap Japhethites. I teach so many times that the Ashkenaz are not, in fact, the Yahudim of the Scripture, not biblical Israel, but Khazars, converts from the Khazarian region. But what I haven't stated before, and people have asked me, if they are not the Jews, then who are the biblical Yahudim? Who are the biblical Yahudim? That's a valid question. Especially considering what we are warned about in Revelation chapter 2 verse 9. Well, let me have the words of David Ben-Gurion tell you who is biblical, is biblical Yahudim. The first leader and founder of the state of Israel was in fact a historian. A historian before he became the founder and leader of the state of Israel. And also Yitzhak ben Zevi. They wrote in 1918 in their history book, I forget its name right now, but they wrote in their history book as they were going to the land of Palestine that in fact the Palestinians or the nomadic Arabs were none other than the Fehalin. The Fehalin is a term for migrant lower class farmers because it is a fabricated history that is sold to you today. The Romans never rounded up all of the Jews in 70 and took them captive. What the Romans did is they plundered the land, took the temple treasures, the Arch of Titus tells you that, and they left prefects to govern a conquered land. But the Jews of Yeshua's time stayed in the land, they were attached to the land, and they worked the land until they had a sabbatical rest. And then they continued to work the land for 49 years until they had a jubilee. And this is what they have done, linked to the land, never left the land. But then, under much persecution, these Fehalin, this is according to David Ben-Gurion, not Matthew Nolan, but David Ben-Gurion and Yitzhak Ben-Zevi. Before they changed the narrative, because it didn't work because of the Hebron massacre, and I believe 1929, they had to realize that the natives of the land, the Palestinians, are the real Yahudim that have been enslaved since 1948 in camps. It's upside down and backwards. These aren't my words. This is David Ben-Gurion and Yitzhak Ben-Zavi. But because the native land workers that never left what happened? Islam came in the 600s and they said that if you didn't convert to Islam that you would continue to pay the jihiz tax. You were so heavily taxed if you were a Jewish farmer that you converted to Islam because you wanted to follow Allah? No, because you were linked to the land, linked to the soil, and you converted so that you wouldn't have to pay the tax so that you could stay in the land. David Ben-Gurion recognized that the Ashkenazi are more associated with the Welsh, whereas the Palestinians are the real Yahudim. But then there was an uprising in Hebron, I believe it was in 1929, and David Ben-Gurion and Yitzhak Ben-Zavi realized we are not going to be able to assimilate the Jews that are in the land into Zionism. We are going to have to come and fabricate a history that is what the current narrative is today. There is an amazing book by Shlomo Sands, and I believe we have it on the Torah to the Tribes About section, which exposes this. These aren't my words. Who are the Jews? I went off on a tangent. 
But Purim and what we are dealing with today is a topsy-turvy, upside-down world. It is a topsy-turvy, upside-down world. Do you know how many Palestinian Christians love Yeshua? Do you know that these are the natural inhabitants of the land? Do you know how many Palestinian Christians have been forced out of their homes in Bethlehem? Look at the demographics of Bethlehem over the past 30 years. It's totally changed. Instead of us doing the work that we should be doing as believers in Yeshua and supporting Palestinian Christians and giving them the message of Torah and the Malkitzedic Covenant, we're all running around wanting to play Jew and dress up for Purim. It's upside downs and backwards. But I shouldn't even be having this conversation with you because it's not good for the ministry. What a wild, crazy, religious, nut job world we live in where people are afraid to speak the truth. People are afraid to, to question the narrative. Read your history. That, those words, I spoke them, but I was coming from the history and the very words of the founder of the state of Israel. And you wonder what is going on in the world today. Our job is to help the Christian Arabs, brethren. Our job is to help those that are born again, that have Yeshua in their heart, that are Arabs. That's where we're to go. You're not supposed to go to those that are the synagogue of Satan that hate Yeshua that put a monkey up on their national television and crucify a monkey with a stripper. And of those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about what is allowed on Israeli national television, the mocking of Yeshua by those that say there are Jews that are not. It's an outrage. It's an outrage to those of us that have Yeshua living within our hearts. And that's what gives me the courage to speak out. Because he is living within me. That's what gives me the courage to speak out. Because my life is a testimony to him and him alone. I don't care. I'm not trying to be anything other than the new creature and creation that he made me when I was 24 years old. And neither should you. Judaism is the most racist religion out there. And we need to look beyond color. We need to look upon national origin because there is neither Jew or Greek, slave or free, but you are all one in Messiah. If you're an Arab and you know Yeshua, then you graft into Israel. But maybe somebody needs to give them the message of the Malkitzedic Covenant. Instead, you're, you're cowering around Jews that hate Yeshua, hoping that you can convert them to the faith. But they don't want to know. Not all, but I'm just saying we need to question the status quo because the media is telling you that the Palestinians are the devil, that they're evil, that they're... The but that's not what David Ben-Gurion and Yitzhak Ben-Zavi wrote in their history books. But they had to change the narrative for the expediation of political Zionism. And I was talking about Purim. I don't know how I got off on that. But let's continue on. Because what happened in 1948 then was this military war of independence. Has that created biblical Israel? Has that created peace in the Middle East? No, it hasn't. You see, the Zionist state is antichrist as it is. And it is threatened by the same kind of terrorism by militant Muslims just as it used on the British, just as it used on the Fehalin, the original Yahudim inhabitants of the land that converted to Islam, not because they were interested in the religion, but they were interested in the land. That is why there are so many Arabs right now that are turning to Yeshua. But we need to be a part 
of realizing that Yahweh's people are the people who have a heart for him. It's all these Arab Christians that are being slaughtered all over the world. Who are the Yehudim? You see, Yahweh has waited patiently for Israel, for the modern state of Israel to produce the fruits of Messiah. But they haven't. Luke 13, chapter 6. Read it. So is he with them? Is he? Esther and her guardian Mordecai were in violation of the Torah. That's simple. Simply put. Because Torah forbade the giving away of Israelite daughters to pagans. And such a crime against Yahweh that later Ezra demanded the returning exiles to divorce, or not even to divorce, excuse me, but just to put them away. They didn't even have to give them a divorce. Because they weren't even legitimately married in the eyes of Yahweh. They were to put away, Ezra said, their foreign wives that they had taken in Babylon. Should we accept any compromise with Yahweh on laws of marriage? Should we? I just had a conversation with a young brother the other day about how the church has compromised when it comes to sexual purity and marriage. I don't believe that we should compromise on any of those things. Let's look at the pagan connections of the pagan deities. Esther to the Babylonian goddess Ishtar, Mordecai to the Babylonian god Marduk, Haman to the Elamite deity Hamun, Vashti to the Elamite goddess Mashti, two sets of gods and goddesses representing two different cultures, Babylonian and Elamite. I am thinking Yahweh has called us to a better way to a narrow way, to a narrow path, and Purim celebrates the broad path. One we're not called to, a path of compromise. That's what it's all about, compromising your faith. Purim setting has resemblance to a pagan power contest between the gods, between the deities of Babylon and Persia. Yahweh, he didn't inspire the book of Esther to be written this way, as an object lesson for us to have a Purim party, I believe Yahweh inspired the book of Esther to be written this way as an object lesson in compromise. Look what happens when you compromise. Don't compromise. Don't compromise because a lesser path will only be the one that is available to you. And we don't want that. He inspired Caiaphas to prophesy the death of Yeshua for the salvation of the nation. But Caiaphas, he got the wrong end of the stick and he misunderstood. Could it be that Yahweh inspired this event, especially for those whom he knew would opt for a lesser path, a path of compromise? I mean, do you still want to pour in party and compromise? I don't. I just don't. It seems to me that the holiday, later known as Purim, arose in the long-established Babylonian Persian diaspora as a Jewish adaption of a Persian end-of-winter masquerade celebration, kind of similar to Europe's carnival and Louisiana's Mardi Gras, with cross-dressing, fornication, and in Jewish synagogues, drinking till you're so drunk that you can't tell the difference between Haman and, I believe they say, Mordecai. That's what it is. I believe Yahweh allowed this book into the scripture to reveal the tactics of our enemy, the serpent seed. The synagogue of S.A. Tan in the last days, where Zionism denies the existence of the Israelite people, whom they consider simply as a bridgehead of a Jewish people engaged in colonialization combined with fragments of an occult nationalized religion. And I don't want any part of that. 
Because Yahweh has called us to a higher way, a higher path. I know that there was a lot of information today, but people are literally going to be drinking the Kool-Aid here in a couple of weeks. And you know, I think we need to look into these things. I've had so many emails over the years and I've never addressed this. And finally, I'm like, you know what, now is the time. There are thousands of brethren out there that have had these questions, that have been concerned, but their leaders have not taught them. They've gone along with the Jewish status quo, the rabbinical status quo, and will continue to do so. But as for me, I'm standing up and I'm saying, look at these things. Because time is short and Yahweh has called us to a higher path, not a path of compromise, not a path of Purim. Questions, comments, anybody? We have a mic, yes. If you go to the About page on Torah to the Tribes, I believe you'll find some of the resources I use. One of those, book is, one of those books is The Invention of the Jewish People by Shlomo Sand. It is internationally recognized as a great work, and of course it has been suppressed thoroughly by the Israelite state or the Zionist state. So. Matthew, this is an online question. Where are the 12 cities of refuge? Where are the 12 cities of refuge? That's a great question. But we live in Shalem, Salem. Down the road is Melech's Valley, King's Valley. Down the road is um, Goshen. So I don't know about out there, but I'm thinking we're pretty good at, you know, out here. And another one was just a comment. If not all Jews are Jews, therefore not all Palestinians are Hamas. Right. Was there was a, a great book I read one time, Son of Hamas. It's a good book. I mean, it's a secular book, but it's, it's a good book. It's about um, the son of one of the Hamas leaders and um, how he was um, thrown in prison and he was taken by Mossad and used as um, an infiltrator into Hamas, and he got saved. He got saved in Bible study. I mean, this is, this is Yahweh's people. He's in their heart. doesn't matter what nationality you are. So, you know, we have to end the racism. Another question. Thank you, Matthew, for... Uh that's on. Thank you, Matthew. It may seem uh, distant why I speak of Perm at this time, but it really um, defines very well our Torah portion, Mishpatim. Um, Mishpatim speaks of judgments. It speaks of decisions. It speaks of, um, it's a protecting measure um, I don't want to go into the word that much, but what happens is that by presenting Purim, you give your hearers an opportunity to make a better or good, better, best judgment, to make better decisions about how they're going to walk, because we know that although uh, our Abba is unconditionally bound to us by his love for us. We are conditionally bound to him. And there are consequences for poor judgments, poor decisions on our part, uh, whether we do the Mardi Gras of Purim and walk there, or w will we give way to more sinful temptations in our life, or will we simply decide and choose to sow bad seed and therefore never uh, um, bear fruit, uh, good fruit from good decisions, good judgments, mishpatim. So really, although maybe mishpatim 
uh, to the rabbinicals might have to do with Levitical law being established and things like that. But really what uh, is really meant by Mishpatim for us is making right decisions in our own lives. Uh, are we listening to the Ruch HaKodesh who invites us to uh, make good, better, best decisions according to the will of God? Is not the will of God um, uh, expressed to us through the Ruch HaKodesh that we might follow it, that we might uh, uh, search out truth as you speak of and, and not be deceived by the rest? And so thank you for your presentation on Purim because it, it helps us to understand uh, what is truth and where will we walk because there are consequences. The conditional aspect of our covenant with our Abba uh, has consequences involved with it. Um, even in uh, Yirmiyahu, in the Haftarah portion, uh, uh, Yahweh says, Fear not, Jacob, my servant, uh, for I am with you. I will make a full end of all the nations to which I have driven you, but you I will not make a full end. However, I will discipline you in just measure, and I will by no means leave you unpunished. So if we want to walk in deception and follow after uh, false gods and the temptations of Mardi Gras and Purim and, and have indecision and, and be double-minded, then we have the consequences of instability. And, and, and so thank you for bringing up Purim. It Thank may you. seem like why bringing up now, but it's a perfect time because like many other things that we are invited to the stability of truth and to walk within the presence of, of truth. Um, and, uh, and so thank you for that. Mishpatim. Mishpatim, making right judgments. And that's really my prayer is that we would look at these things and make the right Mishpatim. All right, blessings. I think we can put the lights on. That's uh, a little ambiance, yeah.